Well, good morning uh, to uh, uh, our palliative care experts, uh, Dr. Finlay, uh, Dr. Woodland, and Dr. Hudson. Um, you are talking not just to the audience uh, which, is, which is here, um, but you're talking in, in particular to the audience which is watching remotely. Uh, there'll probably be something in the region of 100 or so uh, people who are watching by one of our remote means. The first step, though, is that you should each take the oath. Uh, Mary uh, will, uh, will ask you to, uh, to take the oath, and then uh, Ms. Fraser Butlin will ask you the questions. Please state your full name. Benjamin Edward Hudson. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Please state your full name. Hazel Elizabeth Woodland. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Please state your full name. Fiona Ann Finley. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm, and truly declare and affirm, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Before we start, sir, I just want to emphasise that today's focus, this morning's focus, is on palliative care in advanced liver disease. Uh, the inquiry are considering whether to pose further questions to the broader hepatitis group, but today's questions will be focused on palliative care. Could I ask you each to introduce yourself uh, and tell us a little about uh, your uh, experience? Perhaps if we start here with Dr Hudson. Thank you. Um, so I'm a consultant hepatologist. Um, with an interest in uh, palliative medicine. I uh, did my doctoral research on the integration of palliative care into the management of advanced uh, liver disease um, and have subsequently worked as lead of the National British Association for the Study of the Liver National Specialist Interest Group on palliative medicine um, in advanced liver disease. Um. So I'm also a consultant hepatologist uh, working now in Salisbury. Um, I've also uh, completed research uh, focusing on improving care for patients with advanced liver disease, um, and I'm a member of the um, special interest group. I've also worked with um, the British Liver Trust to produce some information for, for patients about uh, palliative care and liver disease and worked on symptom control guidelines for the um, special interest group. And Dr Finlay. Hello, um, I'm a consultant in palliative medicine and I work in the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. Um, most of my job involves, on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing people in hospital with decompensated liver disease. Um, as a registrar, I did a Master of Public Health degree um, with palliative care research as the focus and I did a symptom prevalence study of outpatients who attended with cirrhosis. And I was involved in the same piece of work uh, with Hazel about producing an information leaflet for the British Liver Trust um, to give more information for people with advanced liver disease. And I'm also a member of the same special interest group in the British Association for the Study of the Liver and the End of Life Care branch of that. Thank you. Um, as a group, you've prepared a report addressing uh, the letter of instruction. And is it right that there are no significant areas of disagreement between you? That's correct. Can you start by explaining to us how you define advanced liver disease for the purposes of your report? Sorry. Um, so we use, Fiona used a term then, decompensated cirrhosis. We use that sort of synonymously with advanced liver disease in this report. 
Um, so liver disease can develop for many years in an asymptomatic phase where the liver is, is scarred and damaged, um, but it's fundamentally able to perform its basic functions. And that is what's referred to in, in hepatology as compensated cirrhosis. Uh, decompensated cirrhosis is when the liver stops being able to perform its functions um, and patients develop very significant um, physical symptoms. Um, and that's important for two reasons. It's important because their, their physical symptom burden increases and their quality of life uh, is markedly reduced. But it also signifies a point within the disease trajectory where the prognosis um, deteriorates significantly. So the median survival of a patient once their um, disease enters a decompensated phase um, is two years. Um, so um, in terms of what decompensated liver disease or advanced liver disease looks like to the patient, um, they develop a, a range of, of complications which relate to, to two factors really. One is the, the liver itself unable to be able to perform its, its functions. Um, but it's also because of very high pressure of the blood vessels going through the liver. You have pressure effects. So the most common symptom patients with advanced liver disease or decompensated cirrhosis first present with is ascites. And that is where they have a development of large volumes of fluid within their abdominal cavity. Um, and patients can often start having treatment with medications or water tablets to, to help with that. Um, but it's... It, it, progresses to a stage where they need large volumes of fluid drained on a very regular basis. Um, you're talking sort of 10 to 15 litres of fluid drained from the abdomen on approximately every two to three weeks uh, when the disease becomes advanced. Patients also lose the excretory functions of the liver. So they often become jaundiced, um, which can be um, present with kind of discomfort, itch, yellowing, discoloration of the skin. Because of the very high pressure of, of blood going through the liver. Um, the blood has to get back to the heart somewhere, so you get collateral vessels forming. Um, and patients with very advanced liver disease develop these blood vessels in their esophagus, which are, are referred to as varices. Um, and um, the, the way I explain it to patients is if the motorway is closed, the A roads get really busy um, because the, the blood has to get back somehow. Um, and these blood vessels are at risk of, of rupture, and that's presents as patients vomiting large volumes of blood. That can be an unexpected, very sudden and life-threatening emergency um, and has a, a considerable mortality associated with each um, event. Um, and, but perhaps one of the, the most difficult features of advanced liver disease um, is that the liver reduces its function to, to filter out the toxins produced from the bowel. Um, and so those toxins, again, um, divert around the liver and, and can go into the brain and they can cause a syndrome called hepatic encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy um, consists of a, a, a range of a kind of neuropsychiatric issues which range from um, starting with kind of mild confusion, forgetfulness, inattention, um, progressing through to, to disorientation, loss of balance, loss of understanding um, and then progressing through to coma. And this feature can be um, fluctuant, so patients can have fluctuating, fluctuating levels of, of consciousness and, and cognitive ability. Um, it can become permanent, um, and it can be an incredibly distressing feature both for patients and carers looking after them. And those four main features, so ascites, jaundice, variceal hemorrhage, and hepatic encephalopathy, represent the syndrome of decompensated cirrhosis or advanced liver disease, as it is referred to within the report. Um, however, there are a, a huge range of other physical symptoms which associate with advanced liver disease, um, including uh, muscle cramps, pain, uh, breathlessness, um, sexual dysfunction is almost ubiquitous in, in men with um, cirrhosis. Um, so the, um, the advanced stages of liver disease are punctuated with a very high uh, physical symptomatic burden. 
And um, in terms of the psychological symptoms, in addition to the hepatic encephalopathy, yes. um, what's, what are the psychological symptoms that you've identified? So um, patients with liver disease um, gl um, globally, um, although I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that this inquiry is, is looking at patients who uh, received uh, contaminated blood products, but in terms of the volume of liver disease that we all see in our day-to-day our -day practice, um, patients often come from um, slightly isolated social groups. There are often ongoing issues with um, addiction um, and um, either to, to drug use or, or to alcohol. Um, and those um, issues are often arise from pre-existing psychological issues or mental health issues. So there's often... Um, pre-existing um, psychological issues that are, uh, as, tend to be associated in, in patients who have advanced liver disease. But advanced liver disease in and of itself is associated um, with high rates of depression and high rates of um, anxiety. The, the largest study on this done in the US looked at hospitalised adults in, in the US um, and noticed that these symptoms across all causes of cirrhosis were um, prevalent in, in over 50% of the population. Um, and that extends on to caregivers as well, because the caregiving burden is, is huge. Um, another feature that has been demonstrably contributing to, to mental health difficulties of, of both patients and, and carers is the stigma, the societal stigma, which is associated with cirrhosis. Um, so cirrhosis from any cause um, has a, is associated with a huge societal stigma, huge associations uh, with alcohol um, and drug use within society. And those features of stigma have been shown to, to reduce people's ability to access healthcare services, reduces the quality of healthcare they receive. Um, and so there was that sort of superimposed on an already incredibly difficult state. And I want to pick up some of those themes as we go through, but mm. just um, at this stage, if, given the focus of the in inquiry, can you help us on the ways in which liver disease caused by viral hepatitis um, makes the management and treatment of it more complex? both it particularly thinking about the impact of perhaps having had hepatitis C treatment or um, the increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma? Certainly. So um, the, there was a C change in um, hepatitis C treatment at around 2015, um, where we, as, as this inquiry will be well aware of, we now have uh, direct acting antiviral drugs which are taken orally and are very successful and very well tolerated. Um, however, prior to that, the treatments for hepatitis C were considerably more limited and often revolved around uh, treatment with interferon alpha, uh, which was a drug which had, you know, what we would consider by today's standards very poor rates of, of virological response in the range of sort of 45 to 50 percent treatment um, after a year of of therapy, but was associated with very debilitating uh, psychological side effects of um, depression and um, sometimes um, psychosis and sometimes um, really very severe um, dif mental health difficulties. Um, and that was also not really safe in patients with very advanced liver disease. So prior to 2015, treatment of hepatitis C was very difficult. In the context of advanced liver disease now, in the era of direct acting antivirals, it's been by far the biggest change in my professional career and, and seeing patients before in the days of interferon and now is, is quite remarkable. But it's still, when patients with advanced disease present with hepatitis, it still presents um, prognostic uncertainty. Because if you have very advanced liver disease as a consequence of hepatitis C, um, obviously there is a there is a possibility that you will, uh, uh, you know, a likelihood that you will you will die from that. But also a possibility of regaining some liver function with treatment of of 
hepatitis C. Um, so you are frequently in a position, uh, not just in hepatitis C, but in, in many liver diseases where you are on one side actively treating something which you hope will lead to improvement um, and longevity. Um, on the other side, aware of a reality that there's an uncertainty whether the background liver disease will have been too advanced to be survivable. Um, so you're in that, often in that difficult juxtaposition now. For those patients who cleared their hepatitis using the old treatments or even mm. didn't clear them but underwent the alpha interferon, mm. is their management when you get to the palliative care stage different or more complex because of that history? Um, it, it, if they've obviously patients who have had interferon alpha that have not been successful and it's been half and half obviously that's a huge ordeal and that's a huge disappointment and that um, I think can impact upon the psychological symptoms in terms of how their palliative care is is managed um, I, I it's 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 something that's difficult to generalize on because it's it's an individualised and, and complex um, treatment administration. That, that's, that's, um, but it, it shouldn't... The, the final common pathway of the symptoms which I've described are, are similar. And just thinking about those uh, psychological needs, perhaps the psychosocial needs mm. of the group of people um, who have been infected by infected blood, uh, how might their needs differ from the cohort generally when dealing with advanced liver disease? So um, the, the, the final common pathway in terms of physical symptoms, the features of decompensation is comparable um, regardless of the cause of, of liver disease. So those features of decompensated cirrhosis um, are, are similar. Um, it, and it's, it's difficult to, to generalise, but sometimes patients in that group will, may have um, to struggle more with associated stigma um, because of the general perceptions around liver disease globally. Um, they, um, particularly in, if patients have had a, a late diagnosis or a missed diagnosis, there's often assumptions made about um, alcohol use that may be untrue that I think families and carers and patients um, may find difficult. Um, and there's obviously an extra psychological burden of, uh, about the, the kind of injustice of the way you acquired your disease, and I think that can be difficult to, to get over. I mean, the, the, I'm still seeing patients... This is, this is not a historical thing. This is, I've seen patients within the last few weeks of my practice who, have been, who are presenting with advanced liver disease from... Um, blood transfusions years ago, it, it's, it's still an active issue and these issues are still very live. Dr Finley, for, as a palliative care um, provider, do, do you find that the needs are different for those who have been infected through infected blood or blood products? I think it's quite difficult for me to comment because I've never met anybody who has had their cirrhosis from that route speaking in general terms about applying the principles of palliative care to your question, every individual is unique and they have unique needs. So I, I, for some people, um, their physical symptom burden might not be significant. For them, their psychological burden may be much more significant. And that is where you spend time trying to address those needs and trying to make sure that those needs are as well supported as they may be. So it's very difficult to provide a general answer, but I think my, my assumption, my view, I'll not assume my view would be that I, I think that there will be significant psych psychological sequelae from, from this, and I think those needs should be met in some way, shape or form. Uh, the inquiries heard evidence uh, from those uh, infected or, or affected by infected blood that they have considerable dissatisfaction and distrust um, with healthcare providers and systems. Mm. What impact does that have on an ability to access palliative care and their needs while receiving palliative care? So, I, In my view, it will probably come up in the course of this morning, but um, 
I think one of the things that we are still trying to improve is making sure that people get access to palliative care when they need it, whether that is provided by their hepatology team, providing their core palliative care, or whether that is um, inviting a specialist palliative care team to become involved when issues are more complex. I think there are still issues with people not being able to access palliative care at the time at which they need it. And I think, I think that is something that we are all committed to trying to improve. We've, we've used the term palliative care. May, may, oh. I, may I just ask Oops. one question, uh, arising out of, of that, those exchanges? Um, some of the evidence we've heard uh, about those who've suffered from viral uh, hepatitis uh, has been that the viral hepatitis has caused other uh, morbidities. So, uh, and some of those are, are quite quite serious. Uh, there's anyone who has who's read the report of the hepatitis experts to the inquiry will see that there's actually quite a, a long list uh, of diseases which are not directly associated with the processes that, that you, Dr. Hudson, were describing uh, in respect of the, of the liver decompensation. Does the existence of comorbidities, uh, as intuitively I would expect, does it actually make palliative care more difficult to, first of all, uh, work out what's appropriate, and secondly, to provide it? I wonder if I might direct that question to the hepatologist who would be the ones that would be identifying those who have palliative care needs and maybe I could then add my response to that. Um, you're right and I, I omitted to answer your point about hepatocellular carcinoma when you were saying that as, 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 as well as chronic liver disease, hepatitis C has a, a huge, as you rightly mentioned, has a huge number of other uh, potential sequelae, one of which is, is cancer of the liver, which is increased in, in patients with cirrhosis generally, but more so when the cause of cirrhosis is um, viral hepatitis. Um, and in terms of comorbidities and the existence of palliative care, providing palliative care, does it make it more difficult? Um, in, in my experience, it doesn't necessarily because it, all, it almost um, it, it makes the other curative treatment options um, more less likely to be achievable. So the, the, only, the only really cure for end-stage liver disease is liver transplantation, um, and that is available and suitable for a minority of patients. So um, for a period of research we did between 2013 and 2015 um, in the... Um, United Kingdom, there were about 2,500 liver transplants and the deaths from liver disease in, in that period of time was around sort of 40 to 50,000. Um, so there's, the, the liver transplantation is, is available for a minority. Um, and for when patients have comorbidities, that curative treatment option is, is sometimes not, and, and very clearly not, available. And that can make the provision of palliative care in somewhat sometimes easier because it it makes it gives you a sort of way into the conversation um, having said that um, the patients who are on liver transplant waiting lists around the, the, about 17 percent of patients die whilst waiting for a liver transplantation um, and their needs in terms of physical and psychological needs are are comparable so one of the things I think that we've tried to put through on the report is that palliative, the, de the delivery, of, delivery of palliative care and the delivery of good cirrhosis care up and to and including liver transplantation are not mutually exclusive entities. In, in many ways, they're two sides of the same coin. Thank you. I wonder if, Hazel, you wanted to add to that as a clinician who sees people who have liver disease but also comorbidity and whether that impacts on when you might refer to somebody like me in palliative care. I think it, it sometimes can make the, the conversation a little bit easier to have if people do have more, more comorbidities. They may be slightly more aware of the fact that, that, that their options are more limited and so sometimes it can, as Ben says, be a little bit easier to have that conversation. I think the, the whole... We'll, we'll come on to sort of what palliative care is, I'm, I'm, I suspect, but 
the reality of the palliative care, because you are assessing a patient as an individual, actually their comorbidities, the etiology, the cause of the lived disease, whatever, that doesn't really matter that much or affects your sort of ability to provide palliative care because it is very much on an individual patient basis. And so, you know, and a lot of what the palliative care does isn't related to the condition itself. It's looking at the bigger picture, looking at the holistic picture to try and work out what might improve a person's quality of life. And that often isn't necessarily sometimes the disease-specific stuff. It is some of the other um, aspects of, of their, their lives. So. Yeah, and I, I suppose I would add to that that um, it's not necessarily looking at a list of conditions, it's how they impact on an individual. So um, very often a trigger to referring to a palliative care service or somebody like me might be that somebody has, for example, advanced liver disease. They may have other conditions, but what it means for that person is they are far less able to do for themselves what they were able to do before their diagnosis and, be, and when they were well. So it's trying to meet those needs, recognising that how somebody spends their day-to-day -day life and what they're able to do is hugely affected by their life-limiting illness. And that often is a trigger for somebody like me coming along and seeing a patient. Thank you. Dr Woodland, you, you uh, preempted my next question, which was to explore what palliative care yeah. is. How do you define palliative care? I don't mind who, who answers. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll put that to us. To yeah. um, so it's essentially good care of an individual who has a life-limiting illness. So an illness that, that there is no cure from. Um, traditionally, palliative care was very much associated with cancer and very much associated with care right at the end of life. I'm hoping we might come on to how that definition has broadened over time. Um, but it's um, excellent care of the whole person and in all domains of their life. So not just um, excellent physical symptom control and addressing and management any of the physical symptoms that Ben has touched upon as a result of somebody's advanced liver disease. But it's also recognising the psychological impact of a life-limiting illness on that individual. It's about trying to support and give someone time to express how their illness has affected not just them physically or psychologically, but socially, so their role in their family, their ability to work, their ability to be a parent, um, and also their spiritual needs. Uh, so the big questions, why me? Why has this happened to me? Uh, somebody, as an individual's feeling as to where they fit in the world, which when you have a diagnosis of a life-limiting illness can have a huge impact on how you feel about yourself and your place in the world. So um, it's trying to recognise that with a life-limiting illness comes um, needs not just physical and not just biomedical. It's trying to address all domains of care. And also recognising that people are not individuals in isolation. They often have families who care about them deeply and the impact of a life-limiting illness on an individual has a profound impact on people around you, not necessarily just family members or only family members, carers, friends, um, other significant people in, in their life. So it's trying to care for the, the family and the, the unit close to that individual, not, not just them. There are, I think, more, there is more recognition in national strategy documents that palliative care should be accessible for everybody who needs it, regardless of diagnosis or prognosis. And I think that's possibly a, a, a point that is relevant to this inquiry, um, that I think sometimes there is much more association with cancer than there is with organ failure. Uh, there is increasing recognition that, that people with organ failure have needs that need to be met. Um, so I'm hoping that's a, a good explanation of what palliative care is. And can you tell us what the difference is between palliative care and end-of-life care? So this is a question that I think if you ask every different palliative care person, they will give you a slightly different response to it. I, I think it's fair to say that there is a lot of debate as to the name that we have and the associations or the connotations of that name. So palliative care is care for people who have a life-limiting illness. And what we are trying to increasingly do as a palliative care community is meet people when they require our services. So I will actively say to somebody, I, I meet people at all stages of their illness, and it's based on their needs, it's not just based on their diagnosis. So um, 
the definition for what palliative is, essentially it's when your illness cannot be cured and you might need palliative care right at the beginning of your diagnosis, you might need it throughout your illness, you might need it from time to time, you may only need it right at the end of your life. So end of life care tends to be referring to the final phase of somebody's life, but that time period can be very difficult to determine, which I think in liver disease is a, is a pertinent point. Um, so I, I think end of life care tends to refer very much to the final stage of someone's life, palliative care for the whole period when you have that diagnosis. But I think there is a lot of fear that when somebody from palliative care is asked to be involved in your care, there are assumptions made that you are actively possibly in the final days of your life and I think that can cause a lot of concern and possibly maybe one of the barriers to referral because I think clinicians do not want to cause fear or concern in, in their patients. Because of a preconception of what yes. palliative care is? Yeah. In your report, you've referred to some studies evaluating palliative care interventions and the role and benefit of palliative care. Could you tell us a little bit more about those evaluations and, and what they've shown? Um, in terms of the um, prospective evaluations at, at where it's uh, the improvement in symptoms and the benefits that are, are shown. I don't know whether... It... Yeah, so the, um, Ben, you might want to speak about that because I think you've mentioned yeah, the liver transplantation think... community in your report. And... We, I, I think... Um, the, 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 the studies we referred to in the uh, report, um, the, the, the first one was around, it again comes back to what Fiona was saying about seeing people with on the basis of needs, not necessarily on the basis of, of life expectancy um, at various stages, and the fact that if you wait um, to institute palliative care at the very in the last few days of life, op the, the, the opportunities for most meaning and in interventions are often missed. And so there was a study I referred to that looked at symptom and psychological, physical and, and psychological symptoms um, following uh, the institution of um, a palliative care intervention at the point of assessment for liver transplantation. So this was a group of patients who were very much working towards a curative intervention for their liver disease. Um, and that demonstrated after three months uh, significant improvements in most of the, the key physical, psych physical and psychological symptoms um, associated with liver disease and demonstrates that the two um, concepts of, of uh, control of you focus on the, on the features of, of palliative care, but also curative hepatology care are not mutually exclusive. Um, and the other studies um, referred to in the report, I think, looked at um, a, a non-transplant uh, setting. So looked at a nurse-led intervention of um, supportive care um, across both community and hospital settings, uh, which is incredibly important just and was shown to be well received by uh, patients, carers and, and clinicians um, and provided some continuity between community and, and hospital sec sectors. The, the, I mean, the, the, the course of, of decompensated cirrhosis or advanced liver disease is frequently punctuated by acute, sudden and very distressing admissions to hospital and having some continuity and some care that straddled those sectors um, was important. Can we, um, can we pick that up? Um, can you explain to us when hospitalisation is required for advanced liver disease? Sure. So the, the, the main complications that I referred to, um, the development of ascites, which is often associated with infection, the development of hepatic encephalopathy, or certainly when you have a, a variceal hemorrhage, so vomiting, blood, um, Frequently, that requires um, an emergency hospital admission and often fairly aggressive treatment of that specific complication. Um, and the, the course of liver disease is therefore punctuated by increasingly frequent hospital admissions, increasingly lengthy hospital admissions, and increasingly costly hospital admissions. The, the, the cost to healthcare of liver disease within the last year of life is, is enormous because of the frequency and the intensities of these interventions. There is a risk that um, hospital clinicians seeing patients in isolation for a single complication don't have the wider picture of, of this reflects five hospital admissions in the last six months and the overall 
direction of the trajectory is, is one of decline, and any one of those hospital admissions may well be associated with death. So um, the modalities of death in liver disease can sometimes be dramatic and, and very frequently occur in a hospital um, setting. So I'm not sure if that... It, it does. Your... What then is the impact of palliative care interventions on unplanned hospitalisation for patients with advanced liver disease? So um, the idea, one of the objectives of the palliative care intervention, um, which we've not touched on in the evidence, the, the verbal evidence so far, is an honest discussion with the patient and their clinician and their family about where they are within the wider prognosis where their likely trajectory is and involving patients and carers in decisions and discussions about their own care um, and having those discussions at um, an earlier point in the disease trajectory can sometimes guide other hospital clinicians about how best to treat them in the event of acute emergency and that's something we refer to in the report as anticipatory care planning. Uh, but to do that, you have to have some kind of marker of, of triggering palliative care interventions at an earlier disease stage. Um, so for uh, where I work in Exeter, we have um, a, a multidisciplinary team meeting in advanced liver disease, meeting every month where all new patients with advanced liver disease are brought through. Um, and we, we discuss amongst ourselves what would be an appropriate ceiling of care, if uh, appropriate management plan for that patient were they to be admitted suddenly to hospital and we, it, it sort of gives us a chance to put our foot on the ball, put some time aside and, and talk with the patient and their family about where we are with things and involve them in those um, discussions. So as well as the, the things that Fiona and, and Hazel have talked to about control of physical and psychological symptoms, it also um, just the value of an honest and open discussion about the disease, the prognosis, where we are with things, and the uncertainty, I think, can be very beneficial, both to patients but also to treating clinicians at 2 o'clock in the morning that have never met the patient before. I don't can know I, if you yeah, have anything I, to add. I think it's, obviously, the evidence for, for liver disease specifically is, is relatively limited, but there's quite a lot of evidence for palliative care for patients with other conditions and certainly there's a sort of a very um, uh, well cited study where actually they, they realise that um, if you provided early palliative care to patients with, with lung cancer their prognosis was actually better and I think one of the concerns that people have is that palliative care almost could be giving up but sometimes by having the conversations early where you're focusing on what the priorities are for the patient and what they actually want, what's important to them acknowledging that they have a life-limiting condition and therefore trying to make the most of the time that's available can mean that people have a, a better quality of life, therefore they potentially enjoy life more and actually and maybe not coming to hospital as much and maybe not having procedures done which aren't necessarily going to, to change a prognosis. And so I think that, that evidence from other studies has, has kind yeah. of shown that those conversations can mean that you, you can talk to the patient, because some patients, you know, are very happy to come into hospital for, for, you know, for repeated admissions, and that may well be, you know, the right thing for them, but there will be other patients who will say, actually, I, I, you know, that's not what I want, and if you have the conversations early, it can just allow you to, say, you know, focus your treatment on, on the patient and make sure that's documented clearly, and I say it can actually, at the very least, have a, a similar prognosis, if not potentially extend it, because you're, you know, yeah. you're you're providing more individualised care, I guess. And whilst the studies are, are small, they are starting to come out in liver disease, mm. uh, where trials of, of palliative care interventions do not affect longevity. They improve quality of life, but they don't reduce length of life. Mm. Um, and so this, this concept that you get to the end of curative care and then you start palliative care is one that we need to uh, move away from because it, it means opportunities for meaningful intervention are lost. Yeah, and I, so I think I would add to that, that what a, defining what a palliative care intervention actually is. I, to me, in advanced liver disease, it is very often trying to actively meet somebody's physical symptom needs, um, address their psychosocial concerns, their financial concerns, their spiritual needs alongside active treatment. So we refer to that as parallel planning. Um, in simple terms, hoping for the best and any active 
interventions that are felt to be appropriate for that individual, they still take place. But I sit alongside the team who are performing those interventions and make sure that somebody's needs are met, not just their acute needs because of their critical complication because of their liver disease. So I, I, it's very much not either or, which is what Ben and Hazel are saying. I think it's very much uh, alongside. And I want to delve into the components of good palliative care in just a moment. But before we do, can we talk about access to palliative care? Um, in the UK, in your experience, do pa patients with advanced liver disease have tend to have access to palliative care? I think the best way for me to answer that question is from what I know, because it's very difficult for me to comment on the whole of the UK. Um, I work in a centre with eight hepatologists who are inherently aware of the uncertain nature of advanced liver disease and recognise that it is a core part of their job to be able to have conversations with patients that the future is uncertain and offering them the opportunity to try and meet those needs and they will provide that core palliative care they will have that first discussion and then I will come alongside them so I work in a centre where there is access to palliative care and at the core level so what I mean by that is hepatologists and the team around them providing that and me coming alongside when necessary so I don't meet every patient with advanced liver disease in the hospital but that's because they do that job really well and they don't need my support um, I am aware that I work in a very big hospital in a, a, a large urban centre in Scotland um, that will not be the case where you live throughout the country and throughout the UK so on that basis I would suggest that access to specialist palliative care is, is not universally consistent. You talk in your report that it's patchy. Yeah. Do, um, Dr Hudson, Dr Woodland, do you have any experience or understanding of that patchiness from a hepatology perspective? I think it, a lot of it is to do with um, just resources generally. So it's, it's not specific to palliative care. There's lots of, there is evidence from studies looking at care for hepatology patients in general, that is, there are variations throughout the country. Um, a lot of hospitals don't have dedicated hepatologists, so gastroenterologists can provide care for patients with liver disease as well. Uh, but in bigger hospitals, there will often be general gastroenterologists and specialist hepatologists, and so therefore there's often that discrepancy depending on the size of the hospital. And then within hepatology, there are different, like with any, you know, physicians are like anybody they're, they're different and different focuses different priorities and so you know in some hospitals as a so I'm a new consultant so I've been rotating around hospitals as a registrar and therefore do see lots of different practices uh, and it is it's partly to do with availability of resources partly to do with the, the particular interests of the, the hepatologists often we sub-specialize within our specialties some will have you know different interests and so I don't think you could ever say that there are particular areas of the country that it's better here or it's, it's worse there. It's often on an individual hospital basis. But I think it's getting better because it's becoming more visible, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to, but that yeah. it's, it's just about becoming almost a visible subspecialty within hepatology, um, which I guess is why we're, we're all here today. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think that the stigma around other causes of advanced liver disease, so alcohol or... Um, drug usage plays a, a role in whether palliative care is offered at an earlier stage? I think it can be partly, as you mentioned, to do with the, the distrust that a lot of our patients have for the healthcare system as a whole. So we talked about the fact that, yes, our other patients from this inquiry have, have that distrust, but I think that also would extend to a lot of patients with alcohol-related liver disease or with hepatitis from... from in, uh, injectable drug use, that their experiences of interactions with healthcare workers have often been very difficult and where they have felt that they are being judged and then that leads to that distrust. So, you know, a lot of times physicians, we kind of assume that our patients just naturally trust us and I think with this group of patients, we often have to assume that they don't trust us and we have to build that trust. And so I think that can be one of the challenges because talking about palliative care, it, it does have very difficult connotations and so to, to have... To bring that topic up, you have to have a level of trust built with the patient, and that can take time. So I think just this, the hepatology patients as a whole, for lots of different reasons, uh, can have challenges, you know, building that trust. And so I don't, although the reasons for it might be different with this group, I think a lot of it, is, it would be the, the same for, for other patients um, that, that we see. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, 
Uh, but coming back to your point about stigma, I don't think um, palliative medicine or hepatology professionals um, on the whole um, provide lesser care, for, um, but there is a risk that patients who feel stigmatised because of their disease have much more circuitous access to that care because they're less likely to seek it. Um, it's, there's a huge difficulty in patients with alcohol-related disease that don't feel that they're worthy of treatment and they don't feel they're deserving of treatment and seek treatment late. Um, often you see that in, in transplantation in patients who have been abstinent from alcohol and, and are feeling that they're not deserving of treatment and I think the same is true for any form of care. Um, and one of the battles we have in lived disease more globally is, is moving on from this stigma. Um, both for patients who have lived disease that isn't related to alcohol or drugs, um, but also for patients that do, um, and that this that, that addiction is in and of itself a disease, not a choice, um, is, is an important step we need to get to within general society and within healthcare, um, so people feel deserving of the care that is, is available. And you mentioned the question of resources. Um, how is palliative care funded? So differently, according to where you are in the UK. So my understanding is in England, it's provided by clinical commissioning groups. In Scotland, it's integration boards who provide um, palliative care. Um, I should possibly outline how you access palliative care, the main areas that you might find it. So um, I'm a hospital palliative care clinician working entirely in the acute setting, and my contract is an NHS one. Um, but there are largely um, palliative care clinicians working in the hospice setting, and they are very often independent charitable organisations with some NHS funding, but they are in, in the charitable sector. Um, and so there will be across the country uh, clinicians who will provide in-reach services to hospitals and they have honorary NHS contracts but they are employed by the hospice um, and so access differs across the country depending upon whether you have a hospice nearby to you or, or, or whether there is in-reach to your local hospital service so in that way it, it, it differs and funding is different depending on where in the country you are. And what's the effect of that difference in funding across the UK? What impact does it have on the availability of palliative care? So I would suggest that it's variable, but I think there are many reasons as to why it's variable and it's not just funding related. Um, it, it can be something as simple as the clinical team possibly not recognising that there is a need for palliative care and not making that referral. Um, it may well be that once that referral is made, there aren't possibly resources to see that referral in a timely way. It may well be that if a referral is made to a community palliative care service, if that community palliative care service is quite stretched and they have a lot of patients on their caseload, they may only have a model of service that means that they could provide a one-off consultation and then hand that patient's care back to their general practitioner. Um, so it's difficult to make a generalised statement, but I think that there, is, there are differences in the way that services work across the country and differences in the way that they are funded there. I mean, one of the things we were talking about amongst ourselves before was there is, we're historically on the back foot um, because the hospice movement in the United Kingdom set up by Cicely Saunders was, was set up within the charitable sector um, which covered a lot of ground that the NHS therefore didn't have to. So the obligation to provide high quality services in the way that you would for maternity care for example um, is very different. So it, it, it relies on in, in large parts charitable funds, local setups. Um, and the obligation on commissioners and healthcare trusts to provide good palliative care and good end-of-life care is not um, equitable to other disease areas such as cancer care, maternity care. It's, it's not within the... Um, it's, it's been for too long been seen as an added extra to core good healthcare and, and not kind of core business for hospital and hospital trusts. Because it's relied significantly on the charitable sector for so yes. long. Yeah. In your report, you've identified 10 hallmarks of effective palliative care. Um, first of all, you've identified screening tools. Can you explain to us how, what screening tools are and how they can be used to provide effective palliative care? 
So I can speak about palliative care screening tools in general terms, and I might refer to my hepatology colleagues as to how they use them in a clinical setting. So um, there are many screening tools available, and essentially their purpose is to try and identify at an individual patient level whether somebody has a palliative care need, whatever that might be. And the most successful tools, those that have been used in research and also in clinical practice, do demonstrate that you are much more likely to pick up needs try and meet that need and therefore have better outcomes for that individual and those outcomes are often around whether somebody is able to die in the place of their choosing and when you use a screening tool often that is the first step in making sure that that very important outcome is met. Um, there is a tool for example called the SPICT tool, uh, the Sportive and Palliative Care Indicators tool um, and that looks, uh, it's a single page tool and its purpose is to be used by clinicians from all backgrounds um, and it has at the top of that tool um, very general indicators that somebody might require palliative care. So things like if somebody was coming into hospital as an unscheduled admission more frequently, that is very often a trigger that somebody is not doing well in their health. Um, if somebody is losing weight unintentionally, if their function or what they're able to do for themselves is diminishing, or if they ask themselves for palliative care, then those are often triggers. And then the second part of the tool splits um, needs into diagnosis or organ system um, problem. And there will be inherent in all of those, uh, and cancer, um, some recognised markers for a poor prognosis. So for example, for liver disease, um, hepatorenal syndrome, where not just your liver's not working, but your kidneys are not, are not functioning as well. Um, if you are not suitable for, if you're not um, appropriate or able to have a liver transplant, that also puts you in a very poor prognostic group. So the purpose of that tool is to try and identify the person in front of you needs some extra support. And that does not necessarily need to be provided by a specialist palliative care team. It can very much be provided by that person's core team and then enlist some specialist help when needed. So that is a general palliative care um, screening tool. And I'll, I'll maybe hand over to Hazel and Ben who can talk about how um, liver specific tools are used in clinical practice. I, I mean, I suppose it's, it's the idea of it is to provide a bit more consistency. And I think to where, where we have got hepatologists who might have different sort of ideas about palliative care, the idea of the screening tool is that because it's the same questions that you're asking, you should hopefully maybe be a little bit more objective because I think one of the difficulties with a lot of patients who've got liver disease is they're very young so a lot of our patients will be in their 40s and 50s and somehow just inherently as, as a clinician it can be quite difficult to acknowledge how unwell somebody is when they're when they're quite young and actually by having the screening tools it's forcing you to look at things more objectively and I think that can be um, that can be really helpful to and also to sometimes just to start the conversation to say well we've actually we've looked at this screening tool and you're you know we think that it, this might be something that's helpful for you to kind of broach that conversation now ben can actually talk about a very specific level one because he was sort of involved in in creating it so i'll hand over to him for that um yeah i mean it was similar to the spict it's it's it was the, the bristol prognostic tool was around um looking at things that we already know so screening tools are used in hepatology all the time because they prioritize patients for transplantation and the reason you're prioritising patients for transplantation is that without transplantation, they'll die of liver disease. But following that logic for the fact that for, for a variety of reasons, most patients aren't suitable for liver transplantation, it was, it's around going if they're not suitable for liver transplantation, but they've got liver disease severe enough to warrant it, we sh this should also be triggering a palliative care intervention at that point. So I, I don't think anything in the SPICT or the Bristol tool or, or any tool is is complex hepatology or complex medicine. It's stuff we've been using for years. It's just repurposing it. And, and creating greater consistency in yeah. its use. By you, you can get quite caught up. Um, even I can get quite caught up, and this is my kind of interest, in treating the acute variceal bleed in front of you without realising <coughs> this is their fifth admission in three months and the wider picture is, is difficult. So having something objective to go, all of our patients get screened and... If you had 100 patients with this severity of liver disease, only 50 of them would be alive in three months. It's quite useful for clinicians to, to, to trigger that thought process of perhaps I should be um, starting to think about palliative care. You also uh, discuss as a, as a hallmark good communication and communication to the patient and to the caregiver. What would that communication cover? What, what would it involve? 
again, I think I'll defer to um, Hazel and Ben because they would be the ones Absolutely. having that conversation and I can add anything else. Um, do, you, do you want to ask um, I, I Okay. Um, I think um, a big part of the communication is putting your foot on the ball and being honest with people about where they are in their disease um, prognosis, what the wider picture is, and being frank about the uncertainties of things. I think when you look retrospectively at when we look in our, in our mortality meetings about when things could have been done better, the signs were often there much earlier. And I think it's so an important part of the communication is to offer patients an opportunity to understand their prognosis and the disease. Um, and then talk them through um, the uncertainties of that and to proactively address um, uh, physical and, and psychological symptoms. But to do that, you need a kind of, you need, you need a way into it. And I think an honest discussion about prognosis is helpful. And you speak about that tying into a discussion about illness trajectories. Mm. What, what does that involve? So there's, there's uncertainty in the course of advanced liver disease, particularly if you're working towards a potentially curative outcome uh, such as transplantation. Um, and um, so we can talk about median or average survival and we can talk about what might happen. Um, but even w with any patient, there's a huge amount of, of uncertainty um, with that. Um, so what I try, I use a tool called the kind of best case, worst case, most likely scenario when you talk through the, what the, the best case here is that we'll, you, your disease will get a little bit better after the antiviral treatment, your ascites will um, settle down, we might get you to a functional status where liver transplantation might be achievable. The worst case scenario is, is that you'll have a, a, a significant bleed that won't be survivable and the most likely scenario is there'll be some improvement with this, things might decline and we'll have to do this iteratively. Um, and it's, it's about describing um, the, the, what might happen over the passage of time, the uncertainty that's um, implicit in that, um, and to, to try to develop a relationship with a patient where you're, you're addressing this not as a one-off, we've kind of ticked the communication box, but this is a communication and a relationship that you develop over time and that you assess things iteratively and are able to come back to that conversation. If you bring up palliative care in an inpatient setting when somebody is encephalopathic, has just had a bleed, has a renal syndrome, it's very difficult for that conversation about palliative care to not come across as what we're talking about here is end-of-life care. So it, it's encouraging um, an earlier discussion of, of the possible um, yeah. outcomes. I think it's one of, the, one of the problems is with, with patients with cancer, the prognosis can be a little bit easier to predict. It tends to be more of a sort of a, a, just a general decline mm -hmm. with organ failure, whether it's liver, um, heart, kidneys. What you can often have is people can be at one level, they'll have an event, for example, a, a bleed, they'll come into hospital and be extremely unwell to the point where we are having conversations about end of life care. And actually sometimes then people do get better almost to the point where they were before the admission. And that can be very difficult because we've had these conversations saying, oh, you know, they may well not survive. Then the person gets better, and then that's quite a roller coaster road for, for the family. If you have the conversations a little bit earlier and explain this earlier so that people are aware of that uncertainty, that can actually be quite empowering because they, rather than it coming as a complete shock when someone comes into hospital, they've had that sort of preparation for it. Um, and I think that's, that's where this communication early can be really helpful because we can't, we can't give a definite prognosis, we will never be able to but we can prepare people for the fact that, that there is this uncertainty and actually some studies have shown that, that people respond very well to that and pe people don't necessarily want to know I've got this long, but they just having that conversation can be really, really empowering and really helpful. And how does that link into anticipatory care planning and parallel planning? Yeah, so I think there are probably two main facets to that conversation. There's the information giving, there's the informing the individual and the people around them about the significance of their inpatient admission. And then 
the next step about that, I suppose, is, as Ben and Hazel have both touched on, talking about what the future might be like. And in our experience and what the research shows is, very often people experience a pattern of unscheduled emergency admissions to hospital, um, where often you don't have an awful lot of time to make decisions, you don't have an awful lot of choice. But being able to explain the likely trajectory, the future of a person with liver disease and offer them the opportunity to um, start to describe the choices they might make being in that position in advance, um, that is kind of the, the, the hallmark of good anticipatory care planning for people with advanced liver disease. I think one of the things that patients have talked about in qualitative research research where they are asked their view is very often they do not feel that they have an opportunity to have a say in their health care and in the decisions that they make. But if you're able to give somebody that time to say what they might want in theoretical terms in the future, that is often associated with better quality care. It doesn't always happen that way and I think that we should say that anticipatory care planning by its definition is thinking about the future in theoretical terms. Very often at that time if that happens, that person might make a different decision. That is absolutely okay and we need to have robustness in our systems to recognise that people have a right to change their minds as well as to make choice. Um, but that's what we tend to try and do and that's what I tend to try and do when I meet somebody with advanced liver disease. I, we talk about what the future might be like and they, they suggest what they might want for their care in time to come. And then, because there might be, for example, I think, when it, it depends a little bit on where people's baseline is. So, for example, if somebody's got a pretty good baseline quality of life and they have a, a variceal bleed, well, they'd want us to do everything that we could to stop the bleeding and, and to get them through that episode. There might actually be other people where the point, their quality of life has deteriorated to such a point that they may well say, actually, I don't want to have another endoscopy. I, I, if that happens, what I want you to do is give me medication so that I'm comfortable and I don't want to have blood transfusion, but that's not a decision that you could make at the time that someone's ha having that, that bleed. In that situation, we would do, we would automatically treat them relatively aggressively. That kind of decision is, is we'd only be able to have that in a sort of relatively stable environment, ideally in clinic or, or something like that, um, because that's a very big and difficult decision for people to make. But that's kind of, I suppose, where those, where those decisions can be very helpful um, if they're documented clearly so that when the patient comes in, we are, we're not doing what we would automatically do. We are reacting to that individual person's wishes. And so in those sort of, as you've described, big decisions, they, you would, they would be documented in the medical records? So yes, one of well, the challenges be. that we have, um, and I think um, I'm sure Fiona would also talk about this, is that unfortunately things are not very joined up. Uh, and so one of the, the things that we need to work towards in improving advanced care planning is making sure that if we make a decision in an inpatient or in an outpatient setting in the hospital, that we are sharing that information with the patient's family, with the patient themselves, with the GP, with the paramedics, and that it's really easy to access when the patient comes in via ED, because if it's hidden within clinic letters, when someone's coming in in extremis, people don't have time to access that. So one of the challenges is, and it's, there are areas where it's done better, mm -hmm. but there are certainly, unfortunately, areas within the, you know, the NHS where the, that information sharing isn't clear. And I think that's one of the real challenges, that you can have these incredibly important conversations and make these really big decisions. And then, because of the route that the person ends up coming to hospital, or they happen to be on holiday, they go to a different hospital, something like that, can mean that all of that work c can then almost sort of not, you know, not be counted because it wasn't clear at that time when the person wasn't able to say for themselves what that decision was. Yeah. Yeah. And in the, they're not small decisions, but in the less dramatic, big decisions, should those, that anticipatory care planning also be recorded in the medical records? Things like, as you were discussing, uh, Dr Finlay, um, I, psychosocial needs and care that was going to be pro pro provided along the way absolutely should that be in the medical records yes absolutely i think aspirationally what we would hope is an entirely unified um, it infrastructure where patients in all settings have a system that, that is talking to each other um, the difficulty is the hospital electronic record system doesn't entirely talk to the community-based record system the hospices often have different in 
um, IT systems and you are very reliant on individuals within the hospice, for example, generating a letter, summarising those important discussions and that going to the people that are involved in their care in all settings. And that takes time and it takes resource and so it doesn't always happen. But absolutely, aspirationally, it would be really good for all important information to be in a repository that is universally accessible and very visible. And, and just going, going back a step, when in hepatology care should those conversations be happening? I think um, the com these, these conversations are, are coming back to it. Medicine is, is an iterative process, and I think these, it's not a one-stop shop for these conversations. When should they start? I, I think they should start from the diagnosis of, of pre-serotic liver disease, and that you should talk to patients about um, where they are, if, if things are likely to go well, what might happen. I think the, the, the conversations should should start from the point of diagnosis. That's my personal opinion. I think certainly when you develop decompensated cirrhosis, then that is a very clear line in the sand where you need to decide whether this patient is a candidate for transplantation and if not, how aggressively or otherwise you're going to manage their disease. Um, but I don't think you can start these conversations too early. Mm. Would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, I think, I think that's it. I, you know, I, when I'm seeing people particularly, I think when people come into hospital sometimes, they, they, the first time they discover they have liver disease may be in a, a very acute setting, and the first time they come in is with a, a baroseal bleed, having had no idea they had liver disease before that. The amount of information you can give someone that they would retain in that situation is, is very limited. So whilst you might have a conversation, you might point them in the direction of something like the British Liver Trust where they can then do some reading themselves if if they're able to read, and that is a that is a problem for some some for a lot of people actually. But then when you see them in clinic, that's probably the time to start looking at the, the as Ben says, the best worst you know, most likely sort of situation so that people can start being aware of that uncertainty. Um, and you know we would I would now talk about prognosis average prognosis quite early, just so people understand that it's it's serious. I think when people hear a diagnosis of cancer, automatically the patient and the carer knows that's something bad. The reality is these days, actually, a diagnosis of cirrhosis has got a worse prognosis than many forms of cancer. Um, you know, for patients who can't have a, a transplant, the, the prognosis will be worse. But you tell someone they've got cirrhosis, actually for a lot of people that doesn't mean very much. So the starting point is just explaining what that diagnosis means. And unfortunately, a lot of the time we've made assumptions that we've told someone when they come into hospital they've got cirrhosis, well, they'll know that's bad. And then when you see them in clinic, you've already made so many assumptions about their level of knowledge. So I think starting with what do you understand about your diagnosis should be the starting point for, for our consultations. And then we can build on that and you're starting at, the, at a patient's initial understanding because the reality is for some people, they're even not knowledge of where the liver is, what it does, that it's not the same as the kidneys can be, that's the starting point. And you have to understand where someone's coming from before you can build on that information. And the, the speed at which you give the information will very much depend on the individual um, and what they want to know and the speed they want to take on that information and how you give it. Yeah. The, the cancer comparison is really important. And it's really interesting to look at end of life outcomes in patients with liver cancer compared to patients who die from benign liver disease, so liver disease that isn't cancer, because they're pretty well-matched groups, because 90% of patients who have liver cancer have got it because cirrhosis or liver disease, specifically viral hepatitis, was the primary driver. So they're the same group, but if you have um, liver cancer on top of your liver disease, you're much more likely um, to die um, out of hospital. You're much less likely to be admitted as an acute emergency. Um, you're much more likely to have um, a referral to a specialist in palliative care. Um, and so people get the word cancer. Um, and if you, you match the... And, and because of that, the, the, the subsequent um, end-of-life outcomes are, are better for that group. You've given the figures in your report uh, in relation to uh, those uh, who die in hospital... Uh, Patients with advanced liver disease, uh, it's 78% uh, in your report compared to patients with liver cancer, where it's 39. Yeah, that was that, that dates back from my the, the 2000. That was 2013 to 2015 
that data, and that was all of deaths in England only. Yeah, and I, so what, some of the work that I, I did with Public Health England, which isn't published enough or isn't in the report, but we looked at um, patients who had a specialist palliative care input in their last year of life, um, patients who had a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, around about 50% of them will have received inpatient specialist palliative care input. Um, and that was a pretty steady figure over five years. Patients with chronic liver disease um, who didn't have hepatocellular carcinoma, um, uh, less than 20%. Um, that, that number did increase year on year, showing that we're probably changing our practice. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a significant difference. And I think the, just a diagnosis of cancer means that people are often aware the prob that they, they understand that. And therefore, sometimes clinicians feel more able to then broach the topic of palliative care. I think because of maybe cirrhosis doesn't have that same initial impact, we, some clinicians maybe feel more uncomfortable. And that may be where that discrepancy is is, is coming yeah. from. I mean, the comparisons are really interesting because the groups are otherwise the same. The yeah. modalities of death in H hepatocellular carcinoma and benign liver disease are, are the same as, as we've talked about this morning. That's obviously the experiences in England. Dr Finlay, do you have any reflections in relation to Scotland? So in, from my experience in looking at my local data sets, looking at the last 12, 24 months, I think if you have a cancer diagnosis, a liver cancer diagnosis, you're much more likely to be referred to a local palliative care team, yes. Um, given the symptoms associated with hepatic encephalopathy, what steps should be put in place to ensure that the patient and their carers uh, can understand and, and fully recall the information provided to them in, in this context? Do you want me to take that? Yeah. So simple things can make a massive difference, I think. In my clinical practice, I think that there are people who have subclinical encephalopathy, so they have cognitive impairment that is not immediately noticeable on a conversation within a ward setting. So I think that that is important to recognise because if you're going to deliver important information to somebody and they may not be in a position to retain that information, I think it's really important to have somebody with that person when they receive that information such that there are two pairs of ears, not one, that are, that are taking it in. I would say that is universally a good practice to have a significant other with you when you're getting difficult news or important news. Um, so there's the the way in which you deliver that information is important, making sure that there are people who are able to retain that information. If you're speaking to somebody who may be not able to do that, there is recording that information, as we've spoken about. Um, but I think there's also thinking about the future. If you have somebody in front of you who has had an episode of hepatic encephalopathy, they are at risk of further episodes. And so being able to predict that and being able to say to somebody, you are at risk of losing the ability to express your wishes again in future, um, there is legislation that helps for, for you to have somebody who is able to express your wishes for you. So um, in Scotland, power of attorney, and there are um, very similar um, processes around the UK. Um, but being able to appoint somebody legally who is able to express your wish for you in the event that you're not able to do that yourself, I think you can give people a lot of comfort um, in a situation where they, they may not be able to express their view. I think also one of the things about encephalopathy is again, it's about education, and we don't always... Sometimes the first time someone with liver disease even finds out about encephalopathy is, is when they present with it, and sometimes in quite a, an advanced state, because they haven't been told beforehand that this was a possibility, and there's often quite a delay in it being diagnosed where people think that they've maybe got dementia or that um, if, if they've got hepatocellular carcinoma, they may think that they've got brain tumours. Unfortunately, encephalopathy, even among, amongst doctors, GPs isn't always sort of recognised, so that can, that can delay the diagnosis. So from our point of view, when in the discussions in clinic is about trying to mention that this is a possible um, uh, complication of liver disease so that when it happens, carers or family members who are often the best place to, to notice it, because the early signs can be very subtle and often they can be best noticed by someone who knows that person well and knows that they're just not functioning at their normal level. Uh, and so that can be very helpful because then they, if we've talked about it, then we can try and have the conversations and say, well, look, if that were to occur, it, it is worth having somebody who, you know, who knows your wishes. And that's something that we're getting, I think, better at. But we've been quite reactive in the past where you, the first time you find out about it is when you 
you present with it as opposed to knowing that it is something that, to look out for. So again, it comes back to that early communication and anticipatory care planning yes. so that those yeah. the things yeah. are put in place. Is that fair? And I, yes. yeah. and I think specialist nurses in hepatology are now, because it takes time, I think that's something that we probably do need to recognise, that our, our appointment times in a standard clinic, this is a lot of information to, to cover um, and you don't really want to rush these conversations. We're having more specialist um, hepatology nurses who often will have a slightly longer clinic slot and patients often report that they really feel that that's where they got a lot of their information from about how to manage, how to self-manage encephalopathy. Uh, so I think that's something that is again we're seeing more and more in, in, in different hospitals being utilised to act as um, uh, a link between primary care and secondary care, being able to give information to patients in slightly longer clinic slots, having helplines where carers can call up and describe what's happening and if you're aware of encephalopathy, you can recognise very quickly that that's probably what's happening. And that can be, you know, very reassuring, but it's certainly very patchy in terms of um, provision at the moment. So I'm just about to move to a, a slightly different topic. I wonder if now is a good time to take our morning break. Uh, yes. Well, well, we'll take a, a morning break uh, then uh, and come back at um, 10 to 12. So 10 to 12.